There we go. Maybe just a little bit smaller. There. All right. We're ready. Thank you so much, everyone, for being patient and bearing with us. Um, it is our very first time using the whole Twitch system and, and putting this webinar together. So we thank you um, for all your patience um, while, <laughs> while we were working that out. Um, but yeah, we're here and um, we're excited to get started for tonight. It should only take about 30 minutes to get through the presentation uh, and then there'll be time for questions at the end. So we're pretty excited uh, and um, let's get started. So we'll go to the presentation. Okay, so um, basically what we're doing here is uh, we are trying to um, highlight what sort of injuries are common in gamers. Um, we want to bring awareness to, uh, to the gaming community in particular that, you know, physiotherapy is available for them. They don't have to game through pain. Um, and also that physiotherapy is, can help them improve their gaming experience as well. Um, this is for anyone who plays games, whether it be casual, um, professional, um, elite esports players, and for whatever type of uh, platform you like to use, whether it be PC, mobile, or um, console. So that's what we're essentially here to do today, is to shed some light on physiotherapy management of these common injuries. Um, what I should say though, before we start is it's not a substitute for health professional advice and you shouldn't try to self-diagnose based off what we have discussed here tonight. Um, it's purely for educational and interest purposes, but if this does uh, bring up or like uh, wave some flags for you or highlight some issues for you, um, we are available for you to discuss it one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. So that is that in a nutshell. Uh, moving on to the next slide, we would like to introduce ourselves. So my name is Louise, I'm a physio from Sydney, Australia. I have an interest in treating gamers from all walks of life, uh, be it casual, professional, PC, console, you name it. My passion is gaming and I want to make sure you can enjoy it uh, long into your life. So that is a little bit from me and then I'll get Tung to introduce himself. Hey everyone, um, my name is Tung and I'm a physio originally from Perth, now living in Melbourne for the past 10 years. So like Lou, I have a keen interest in treating gamers and I think there hasn't been enough focus on the health of gamers and it's missing from the esports scene. So gamers will get injuries like any other athlete and should be treated as such. Yeah. Um, so just a little bit, I guess, that sums us both up is we are both passionate about video games, as we've said, um, having played a variety of games during our lifetime, uh, we combine both our knowledge of video games with our knowledge of physiotherapy to help those who need it. Uh, we understand the mechanics and requirements of different game genres and what it takes to become a master in your particular game. We are advocates for video games and the online industries. We believe that pursuing video games, streaming, shoutcasting, and other activities is a valid and rewarding profession. And we want to see and contribute to your success in that. And also we have experience treating these injuries that we are going to speak about today. So a little bit of an overview of what we'll be talking about today. So the injuries we'll be covering are neck pain, headache, back pain, carpal tunnel syndrome, and gamer's thumb. We're going to be looking at what the condition is, the cause, the risk factors for the condition, the common symptoms, and the physiotherapy management. Uh, we'll also talk about why physio is great for managing these injuries uh, and why you should consider speaking to a physiotherapist about your various aches and pains. Uh, we'll also talk about telehealth and why it's a great option, especially for gamers. And to finish, we'll answer any questions that you may have. So uh, if you're watching us on Twitch, there is a um, little question box that looks like this image and you can write your questions in there and everyone can upvote the popular questions if you want. Of course, you're always welcome to type your questions in the chat and we'll get to those questions as well. Okay, let's get started. So injuries among us. 
There is very limited research available about common injuries in gaming. However, what we have been able to see so far is that common injuries do differ between whether you're a console gamer versus a PC gamer. Um, however, within the differences, there are similar similarities between the two. Um, we've also got some more recent data from a fellow organization over in the US called 1HP, and they do lots of close work with gamers, especially esports players. Um, and they've collected all this wonderful data um, to find out over the past year to find out what sort of common conditions they were seeing and treating. Uh, so we can see that the most common injury was wrist and hand um, injuries. And then this was followed by shoulder, then neck, then lower back, and then other, and then mid back injuries. Um, and more data is available on their website. Uh, if you want to check it out, I'll just click the link and take you there real quick. If my internet decides, yeah. So there is some um, more data on there uh, available for you to read if you're interested. So basically what we did with this information and we used it to help guide what we should talk about today. Um, and we are only covering a few injuries here, but it is our hope that we, when we, we're gonna host more of these talks in the future and talk about other injuries in the future. And hopefully with some other physios, which would be really great. All right, so Tung's gonna take it from here and he's gonna talk about neck pain. All right, thanks, Lou. Um, yeah, so the first area that we are going to cover is neck pain. Um, and if we go into the next slide, we'll be looking at some of our common oh symptoms. Gosh. So the thing with neck pain is it can be really variable. So it can be anywhere from like a small annoying discomfort to really extremely painful and sharp. Uh, there could be difficulty moving the head in the neck, like when you turn your head while you're driving, or even if you're just looking over a really large or multiple monitors. Now, these symptoms can refer from the neck down into the shoulders and uh, arms and hands. And sometimes these nerve irritations from your neck can actually feel a lot like carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a condition that Lou will be going into a bit later on. Now, beyond the symptoms in the neck, if it starts referring down into your arms and hands, it can really physically affect your performance and how much you enjoy your game. Uh, having a chronically stiff and sore neck can also lead to headaches, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So going on to our next slide, we'll be looking at the causes and the risk factors. So what are some of the common causes? Uh, sometimes it can just be sleeping in a really awkward position can lead to you waking up with this neck pain. Uh, it could just be some repetitive motion. So just moving your head repeatedly in a certain direction for long enough can end up causing you this neck pain. Uh, other things being slouching with poor posture at your desk uh, or couch can put a lot of stress through the neck. And speaking of stress, excessive stress or anxiety uh, can actually lead to neck pain as well. So a lot of people tell me that they hold their stress in the neck or their shoulders. And I mean, it makes a lot of sense. When you're stressed, you tend to tighten up your muscles and the ones around your neck are most likely to tighten up when you're stressed. Uh, other things can be holding the neck in an abnormal position for a long period. So whether that's because you're going forward like this because you're just staring at a screen or if you're on your phone or even if you're leaning on your hand like this and your neck is in this really awkward angle for a long period of time. Other some, um, some little specific causes can include arthritis, uh, disc herniations, as well as uh, joint sprains. Now, some of the risk factors that lead to an increased chance of developing neck pain include uh, having poor ergonomics in regards to your setup, uh, having a low range of motion for your neck to begin with, reduced endurance of your neck muscles, and poor posture. Now, uh, when we look to the management of our neck pain, there are several ways of managing the neck pain, um, regardless of what that initial cause is. So the first thing we'll have a look at is assess and adjust the ergonomics of your setup. Uh, things like manual therapy, like massage, 
and joint mobilization can give you that uh, temporary relief, uh, stretches to alleviate muscle tightness, and most importantly, exercise. So improving the control and the strength of your postural muscles helps to reduce the chances of that neck pain returning. So leading into headaches, we know that it is quite closely related to neck pain. Uh, they're really commonly associated with each other. Now, again, just like our neck pain symptoms, the headache symptoms can be quite variable. So it could be on one side or both sides of the head. It could pulse, it might not. Could be really mild, could be moderate or really extreme. Um, to the point it could even feel like a migraine, like the kind of headache where you end up uh, wanting to go into a dark room and just lie down. There may or may not be associated neck pain and stiffness. And sometimes with headaches, it can be sort of weird where the feeling is like behind or above your eye. And it can be so bad that it causes nausea. So some of the causes of these headaches. Uh, one of them is tightness in those muscles surrounding your neck and your shoulders. Now, these muscles, they connect up into the base of your skull and they're closely related to those muscles that are around your head. So this is that typical tension headache that you might have uh, heard, about, heard about in the past. Uh, other times, headaches can be caused by stiffness in the neck. Now, researchers haven't figured out exactly the, the pathway a stiff neck causes headaches, but we do know that there's a definite relationship. So if we say felt around those couple of joints in the neck, mm -hmm. and if we found some which were really painful and stiff and we press on it, it can cause the headache to come on. Now, interestingly, if we press and hold this point, it can then take away the headache. So we know that there's that relationship, but we don't exactly know why. But this kind of headache is called a cervicogenic headache. Now, the risk factors for getting these headaches, one of them is if you are biologically female. Again, unsure as to exactly why, but the statistics do show that females are more likely to get headaches uh, if you are older than 40 and previous injuries to the head and the neck. In terms of management for the headache, some of those um, hands-on techniques that can temporarily alleviate the headaches would be massage, mobilization, manipulation, uh, acupuncture, or dry needling. But in order to really take care of it so that it doesn't come back, then we're looking at things like posture correction, and again, most importantly, exercise. So that is neck pain and headaches. Uh, the next topic we're going to be looking at is lower back pain. Um, now, with lower back pain, 60 to 80% of people in this world will experience low back pain at some point in their lifetime. When we look to the symptoms of lower back pain, it's basically anywhere, uh, any pain, sorry, between the 12th rib, so that last rib right here, um, all the way down to the top of your legs. Now, you could have uh, muscle stiffness and tightness. It could be painful to touch or with movement, and it can refer down into your legs. Um, sorry, Luke, can you jump to that next slide? Um, so yeah, some of the causes for low back pain, uh, that can be a number of different things. It usually begins with an initial injury. So that's things that you might've heard about like uh, disc bulges, facet joint sprains, uh, sacroiliac joint dysfunction. And one of our favorite terms, spondylolisthesis, nice long word. The subsequent decreased core control, uh, strength and endurance, I would say is the biggest contributor to ongoing lower back pain. Um, and some of those other causes being poor ergonomics and poor lifting technique. The risk factors for low back pain include having a prior history of back pain, uh, your posture, and if you have a high BMI, so if you're overweight or obese. When we look at the management of low back pain, it's a lot of the stuff that we've covered already. So we're looking at the ergonomics, of your setup, here's a little diagram. 
that I've, uh, I've found for us. And we want to assess it. We want to adjust it. The other things we're looking at is identifying any muscle imbalances. So which muscles are too tight? Which ones are too weak? And following on from that, again, it's exercise. It's super important. If you have a good amount of core control and strength, the back will feel great. Um, yeah, so that's lower back pain. And I'll hand it over to Lou for the other conditions we're looking at. Mike on. Beautiful. Thanks for that. So now we're going to be talking about gamer's thumb. And I'm not being rude, Tung. I'm just going to mute you just so we can get a clear connection going through. No worries. Beautiful. Okay. So gamer's thumb. Um, what is gamer's thumb? So gamer's thumb affects the tendons and muscles of the thumb. So this bad boy here. Uh, at the wrist, these tendons run through a tunnel or sheath. And this portion here. And this sheath can become thickened and because it's thick, the tunnel becomes narrow uh, and then the tendons aren't able to run through that sheath or tunnel properly and then they become irritated and then irritation leads to pain. So that's essentially what it is. If we have a look at this diagram here, we can get a better view of what I am talking about. So we have the sheaths here. Uh, and these are the two muscles that uh, are affected and these are the tendons that are affected in gamer's thumb there. So you can see once the sheath gets narrowed, the tendon is going to rub inside and get irritated and get, um, get sore. Uh, what are the symptoms? So the first one you might get is pain in the wrist on the thumb side of the hand. So that's pain just in this area here. You might get pain on bending the thumb, so moving the thumb in different directions. What that's doing is we're stretching the tendon, the tendons in here, uh, and it's also using those muscles there. Uh, you can get pain on bending the wrist towards the pinky, so that we call ulnar deviation. And again, that's stretching those tendons and irritating the tendons as they move through and get caught in that sheath. Uh, you might have some swelling in this area if it's particularly bad. And also you might have difficulty with grasping objects, uh, turning keys or pinching. Uh, if we want to make this specific to gamers, then it'll be things like using the joystick on your control or if you're on a mobile phone, using your thumbs to direct your play. Uh, or if you're on the um PC, it might be if you have uh, macros uh, on your mouse, if you have a programmable mouse and you've got the programmed into your thumb button, it could um, cause the pain there. Uh, the exact cause is unknown. So you've got hitting your wrist on something. So if you bang it on something, that's going to hurt it. Or if something hits the wrist, like an object was thrown and it happens to hit your wrist, um, that can be a cause of the pain. Uh, when you have compression on your wrist, so like if you're wearing a watch like I am, that's why we don't have our watches, our watch straps too tight because it can cause compression on those tendons and irritate them. Repetitive use of the muscles of the tendons of the thumb and wrist, again, using those controllers, the different controllers uh, and the mouse and the phone. Having a medical history of inflammatory diseases, so rheumatoid arthritis and gout. So this has got to do with sort of the chemical environment surrounding the tendons um, and this can irritate the tendon if the environment is um, prone to inflammation and then also anatomical differences so the tendon sheath might be more narrow in some people um, the tendons might cross in a different area there's all sorts of differences between me and between you and between everyone else that could potentially um, cause more irritation of these tendons what are the risk factors well again we've got being female uh, if you're older than 40 uh, if you do manual work, again, frequent prolonged thumb use, so using those controllers and the mobile and the programmable mouse after giving birth. So a lot of um, mothers, they pick up their children and that causes a lot of that wrist turning action, uh, stretching the tendon and irritating the tendon in that sheath. They have to pick up that heavy baby and their muscles aren't necessarily used to being able to do that computer use and also interestingly with a lot of these conditions there is a component or a risk factor of anxiety and depression um, 
these heighten your nervous system uh, and make you more susceptible to feeling pain. So sometimes when you're, you're stressed or you're depressed or you're anxious, you can actually feel more pain than if you're more relaxed. What's the management? Well, there's both non-surgical management and surgical management. Um, we as physios are more concerned with the non-surgical management, but we will step in for the um, post-surgical management. If you do go through surgery, we'll help you with your rehab. So the non-surgical management is for mild to moderate cases. Uh, it involves education on the conditions, so you have a better understanding of what's going on. Uh, ergonomic evaluation, so we will check your mouse setup, we'll check how you're using your controller even, or the program, like how you've programmed your mouse. We might even modify these activities, so get you to use it in a different position or change your macros. Um, we will correct technique as well. So again, we'll look at how you're using it and give pointers about how to use that in a more efficient and less uh, irritating manner for your tendons. And then we've got our hands-on. We've got massage, um, that's for temporarily pain relief, uh, taping and splinting, corticosteroid injection and NSAIDs, which is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. It's a bit of a mouthful. That's why we say NSAIDs instead. Um, there again for temporary pain relief um, and also offloading the tendons so that they're not uh, getting irritated as much. Um, however, as we have been saying through this whole presentation, exercise is going to be the key to getting you back on track and getting you um, back to gaming at your peak performance. Um, with exercise, we're going to be doing things like load tolerance and load management. Um, and then helping you with strength and endurance uh, and things of that nature. For surgical management, we're, this is for more severe cases or cases that haven't responded to the non-surgical management. And th w essentially what this involves is going in and um, cutting the tendon sheaths so that way uh, the, there's not compression on them and they're not getting irritated as they move. But we want to try and avoid this as much as possible. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the, the big one, carpal tunnel syndrome. So what is carpal tunnel syndrome? Well, the carpal tunnel is an anatomical structure and it's made up of your wrist bones and then there's a ligament that goes over here and then you also have these fluid filled sacs on the inside, you've got tendons running through and then you have the median nerve as well and the median nerve is the thing that gets irritated in carpal tunnel syndrome and that is what carpal tunnel syndrome is. So again, we'll have a look at a picture of the carpal tunnel. We can see we've got the wrist bones here, the carpal bones, and then we've got this ligament over the top. We have these tendons here inside the tunnel, and then we have this nerve here, the median nerve. Um, so there's a lot of structures inside there, and because there's a lot of structures inside there, um, there's a lot of potential for things to get irritated. And you can see it, just because you do have pain in your wrist doesn't mean that you'll have carpal tunnel syndrome as there is a lot of things that can go awry in that area. Um, what are the symptoms? Well, we've got numbness and tingling or numbness or tingling in the thumb, in the pointer, in the middle finger and the ring side of the, uh, sorry, the thumb side of the ring finger. So this has just got to do with the sensory distribution of the nerve, so where the nerve is um, detecting signals of sensation. Um, and then it's usually worse at night. You may have a loss of strength and you might also in severe cases get muscle wasting because not only is it sending uh, receiving sensory signals, it's also sending motor signals to the muscles in your hand. Uh, and you may you may experience weakness and numbness because of that. I mean, weakness and muscle wasting because of that. So what's the cause? Again, it's unknown, um, but the research has said that it could be due to increased pressure within the tunnel, increased pressure within the nerve sheath itself, uh, decreased blood flow to the nerve, formation of scar tissue on the nerve or on the tendons, or compression from adjacent structures within the tunnel. What are the risk factors? Again, being female, if you're older than 50, forceful hand use, uh, if you're obese, or if you have diabetes. Um, 
Interestingly, there is very weak evidence to support that computer use, risk position and repetitive work are risk factors for carpal tunnel syndrome. So if we go back to the picture, we can see that there's a lot of structures in there. And like I said before, just because you have pain in your wrist doesn't mean it's carpal tunnel syndrome. Because you're using your hands a lot, it's more likely that the tendons are going to be affected and irritated rather than the nerve. Um, so it's more that really hard uh, manual labor that is going to cause you to have uh, symptoms like carpal tunnel syndrome and um, the repetitive work, the wrist positioning and the computer use uh, are more likely to be that the tendon is irritated. So what's the management? Again, there's non-surgical management and there's surgical management. For mild to moderate cases, we're going to talk about the condition again. We're going to let you know what it's about. We're going to uh, assess your ergonomic environment and see if that's set up correctly and whether there's anything that might be contributing to the pain you're feeling. We're going to modify your activities again. We're going to correct your technique again. Um, and then we've got some pain relief uh, modalities, which is a like wrist brace or splint worn at night, um, heat, electric therapeutic modalities. So that's just a fancy term for like using ultrasound or some other sort of machine um, that we apply to the wrist that will help decrease pain, uh, corticosteroid injection and NSAIDs. Uh, but all that isn't going to cure it and it's not going to prevent the pain um, long term. Again, we're going to be doing exercises to help you get better. Um, and then the surgical management is, again, for severe cases or cases that have not responded to non-surgical management. And these, um, and this is, again, is deep compression of the carpal tunnel, depending on what they think is a contributing factor. Okay, so we've talked about these injuries. Now we're going to talk about why physiotherapy is a great idea and something that you should consider when you do have pain and aches and things of that nature. So physiotherapists are trained to diagnose and treat conditions. We reduce pain and stiffness, increase movement and com uh, commonly affected conditions uh, that are treated by physiotherapists. So it makes sense to see a physio about your problems. So everything that we've talked about today is conducive to physiotherapy management. So why not come and see a physio? So everything that we've talked about today oh. is conducive to physiotherapy management. So why not come and see a physio? So I'll do that. We're going to go get into a loop. There we go. <laughs> um, next one is. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Oh, no, I've. Oh, no, I've clicked out of it. There we go. So the next one, uh, we are trained to prioritize you and your needs and tailor our treatment specifically to you. We do our patient centered practice, which means that we're always trying to put you first and make sure that we are reaching your goals um, and getting you back to doing what it is you want to do. We really put an emphasis on you um, being the center of our management, not the thing that is, uh, not the thing, like the, the body part. We recognize that you are a human and that um, we're treating you with dignity and respect as well. We uh, use evidence-based practice to ensure we are providing you with the most up-to-date and proven methods of treatment. Uh, we want to make sure that everything that we do with you is supported, um, there's evidence behind it, and that it is the best evidence um, out there to support what it is we're doing um, to make sure we're going to get good results. Uh, we are required to complete a certain amount of hours of continued professional development to ensure our skills, knowledge uh, remain up to date and in tip-top form. We're always refreshing our, um, our knowledge and our skills to make sure, again, that you are getting the very best treatment uh, available and possible. Unlike, your speci unlike specialists, you don't need a GP referral to see a physiotherapist. If you have a problem or concern, you can come straight to us with your questions, um, which is really great. It takes away one of the barriers, which is access, and it just makes it easier for you to get answers and to get treatment um, as soon as possible. We work together 
with other allied health professionals such as GPs, specialists, OTs, EPs and psychologists for a more holistic approach to treatment. Again, we don't see just the injury, we see you as a whole person and we want to make sure that we are getting at whatever is um, affecting you from all angles and making sure that we are um, addressing absolutely every single aspect that could be contributing to your issue. So like I said earlier before, anxiety and depression um, can be uh, risk factors for certain conditions and they can certainly exacerbate pain. So we might refer you on to a psychologist if you're open to it uh, and they can also help you as well manage those um, manage those two. Uh, we are registered health professionals who uphold a code of conduct and need to comply with strict standards of health and safety to keep practicing our profession. And your health and safety is our tip top priority. It's number one. Uh, and this makes sure that we as a, a as an industry are all held accountable and everything that we do is with safety in mind. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to hand back over to Tung and he's going to talk about telehealth. So you should be back. All right, cool. We're back. Sorry about that, team. I unmuted at the wrong time. <laughs> <laughs> all good. All right, cool. So we're, oh we're talking gosh. about telehealth physio. Um, essentially telehealth physio is what we're doing right now. You would have a private video, um, call where we go through your background, go through your injury. Uh, we can also do our physical assessments, like, uh, looking at your range of motion, teach you how to self palpate. So that's what we do when we have a poke round, trying to feel, uh, for sore spots and differences. Uh, we can also complete our special tests all through uh, our telehealth call. And we can also go through things like uh, education around self-management, the ergonomics, uh, the actual physiology of your injury, as well as trial all those exercises and assess your response. So what's interesting is that studies have shown that telehealth assessment and treatments are not inferior to in-person. So just as good uh, doing telehealth as going into a brick and mortar clinic. It's um, <clears throat> more accessible. Uh, we can assess your setup, but at the same time, if telehealth doesn't suit you, we can still come to you. So uh, both Lou and I offer mobile physiotherapy services. Lou's based in Sydney and myself in Melbourne. So if that is your preference, uh, we can do that. Cool. Beautiful. And that's it for tonight. So now is the time for questions. If you had any questions, um, anything that popped up from what we covered today, please feel free to put it in the chat or in that box below the stream, which is just here. This is the stream up here and this is the box here. Pop your questions in and we'll be happy to answer anything that comes up. We'll be hanging around for a few minutes for those to come in. But before you leave, if you do leave, if you have to go somewhere, we just want to say thank you once again for coming on by and for joining in. I think we have a question. Um, do you have any knowledge on more or less ergonomic controllers? Hmm. Controllers? Personally, controllers, I do not. Um, I know that there are some more ergonomic keyboards out there and my good friend Kev Fluke, who I believe was watching before, he did an unboxing of one of these controllers um, earlier, like last week I think it was. Um, uh, not controller, a keyboard I should say. And basically all it is is it's just a shorter keyboard that prevents you from having to twist your, your hand and move your hand in an awkward position or twist your keyboard to the side to try and access both at the same time. But unfortunately, no, I don't have any um, ergonomic controllers that I've seen out there. Tung, do you? Um, I'll, uh, that, I know that there are a few out there mm. that's um, that like a concept product. So sort of similar to those, um, those split keyboards where you can have like a split controller. Um, so that can potentially help yeah, ergonomics wise. So instead of holding like this, you can actually 
hold apart, whatever's most comfortable to you. Um, I would say just from looking at your two major controllers, if we're looking at your PlayStation and your Xbox controller, I would say that Xbox controller tends to fit your hand quite well. Um, whereas I guess the PlayStation co controller, you're more prone to have just be like holding your fingers up all the time rather than resting your palms on the controller. So I think if I had to lean towards one, it would be the Xbox controller, but I'd say everyone's very different. It's like with the mouse, like some people are claw grip, other people are palm grip. It'd be the same for a controller. We'd really want to assess the way that you play with the controller. And it might be less to do with, um, the controller itself it might just be to do with your habits but you know it, it's something that would have to have a look at yeah excellent good points there um okay so we've got another one we've got another two actually what has the reception been like within the esport community to physiotherapy have they been open to physio hmm. any uh any opinions there, Lou? Well, I know in America they're a lot more uh, open to it, um, whereas in Australia, not so much. Uh, I do have more of the amateurs coming through. Um, oh, Kev has also helped out and answered the question about ergonomics. So thank you so much for that. Um, as I was saying, uh, I, I have been able to speak to a few people, but they are more casual um, and like semi-pro, I wouldn't say any of the elites people um, have taken on physiotherapy, at least not from from me. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. If, if we have a think of like the overall international reception, I'd say overall it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot slower compared to like your traditional sports. Um, if we look back to, oh, I think it would have been last year or the year before, oh, wait. You know what, COVID's messing up my timeline, but um, Uzi from League of Legends uh, had to retire due to um, his consistent recurring injuries. So they, I know from their videos, I think they did a video with like Nike or something where they actually went to see physios and personal trainers and stuff. And um, it seems like everyone's actually coming in um, and, and being a little bit more on board with the actual physical and mental health of um, our esports players. So I think it's getting there. It's just still really slow. Like if if Uzi and his teams had um, you know access to physiotherapy and other healthcare, then there's that potential that he might not have retired due to injury. Um, so it's getting there, but overall, I'd say it's still too slow. Hmm, definitely. Uh, another question. Were there any specific exercise programs 1HP provided to their eSport athletes, like for general injury prevention? I'm not exactly sure because I'm not part of 1HP, so uh, I would assume that they do have um, – I would assume that they would do this on a one versus one, like a physio on patient um, basis, and they would tailor the exercise in the um, – injury prevention to the specific person and what their injury was. I'm not sure if there is like a, a general program that you can undergo. Um, with these sorts of things, it's very individualized and very specific to the person. Um, so you can have, in other sports, you can have uh, prevention and I suppose you can probably come up with a prevention program. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it was done on the individual le level at this stage. Yeah, I, I agree with Lou as well. Um, I reckon they would, like many other physios out there, would have a general like skeleton on their approach towards certain kinds of um, prevention exercises. And um, yeah, like Lou said, you do want to be very individualized because there are certain exercises that, you know, my body just doesn't like, and it that's the the preference of my body. So I have to uh, be able to figure out what exercises are appropriate for me. And it's the same thing for an individual. We have to figure out what is most appropriate for them. 
Um, I would imagine that they're doing something similar. Um, we can create like general programs based on uh, different uh, programs from, from like research, you know, based around tendinopathy and, and other specific conditions. But from there, we always sort of branch out uh, into the into the specifics of the individual. Okay, yeah. So Kev has just said, yeah, we use basic principles with a deep understanding of the gamer's play. Yeah, so very much, um, very much to do with the individual person, but have a mm. basic sort of basic, yeah, the basic principles underlying it. Um, next question is, what did you need to do to call yourself an esports physio? Did you need certain extra training, or is it just self-directed learning? Um, yeah, it's uh, pretty much self-directed learning and uh, an accumulation of patients that you're treating. There isn't at the moment a, a CPD or a course that you can do, but I do know of one that is being developed, which is pretty exciting. And I'm definitely going to be, I'm definitely going to be jumping on top of that and getting involved in that when that comes out. Um, but yeah, it's uh, it basically got to do with your patient load uh, and who you see regularly. Yeah, so in Australia, sorry to interrupt, Luke. Yeah, um, keep going. Uh, yeah, in Australia, we have uh, what we call titled physiotherapists. So where you can, uh, you know, call yourself a pediatric physio or, or a cardiorespiratory physio. So they're really specific titles that you can only call yourself once you have completed the necessary learning. Um, so at the moment, you know, esports is like even though it's been around for a while, it's still relatively new on the scene in terms of sport in general. So it, it definitely stands to say that um, esports physio is extremely new. Um, but yeah, super exciting to know that there is CPD in the works in regards to esports physiotherapy. And you know, we can only hope that in the future, uh, you know, it could be become a titled musculoskeletal esports physio that'd be awesome that would be incredible um kev has just said an esports cpd is in the works and also an esports textbook is coming soon so there are things like it's starting to take traction and people are starting to get more involved and more interested in it um but yeah still a very small community and still no titling for it but fingers crossed uh it'll be coming soon hmm. So cool. I think that's it, unless anyone else has any more questions. Maybe I click it. No, it didn't. It didn't do anything. It's fine. It can stay there. Well, I guess um, before we do finish up, I would like to mention that both uh, Lou and I um, at, you know, Level Up Physio and then at Hit Point Physio, we are offering a, uh, I think it was a 15% discount for the first appointment mm -hmm. for our viewers mm -hmm. tonight. Um, so yeah, if you book in, uh, you know, leave a message uh, when you book in online um, or you can give us a call and just mention that you are at the stream and yeah, we can apply that discount. 100%, yep. And uh, I am available Monday through Friday and Tung, you're available. Uh, yeah, Monday through Fridays in the evenings mm -hmm. as well as Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, I'm a physio just looking into taking up esports physio as extra part-time work. How did you gain the initial patient experience? Oh, okay. So how, oh, just through friends, just through people who I, who I know personally and who game, um, they come to me with their questions or with their, with their pain and I go from there. How about you? Have you had, um, many people come to you Tom, for treatment? Um, I mean, not just yet, there hasn't uh, been all that much traction and it's difficult when, um, you know, COVID comes into play, but I guess that, um, you know, that initial patient experience, I mean, if you take the experiences that you gain through the work that you've done previously, and, you know, you look at, you know, how you treat your everyday sporting injury, you know, treat the, um, an esports gamer exactly the same. Like assess what's going on with them, look at those contributing factors, and then um, help them out from there. Yeah, hundred percent. There, there are definitely um, more non gamers who I've treated, but they have been uh, they have been complaining of computer use issues, um, and so I've applied, you know, that knowledge to my 
game of friends that come in and ask for help. Um, I think if you are interested in getting into esports physio, um, I would take as much as you can from just your general practice in treating just general patients um, and things that are sort of similar and related. And then as you slowly gain experience and um, a patient a patient list, um, you can start to sort of pursue more esports um, or gaming related patients and clients. Hmm. And uh, another little tip I would say is those games that you find really enjoyable, spend a bit of time trying to grind it out and improve there. You'll have a small window into what those esports players have, um, have to work through. Like if you're into your shooters, play those aim trainers um, and see how it feels. How does it affect yourself? Um, you know, if you're like playing Dota, you know, see how that feels for your, your fingers after you've played like a bunch of Osu. Um, it's the same sort of thing that I've done myself in the past when I was going through uni and playing a lot of games. So I've got that like personal experience there and that informs my physiotherapy treatment. So yeah. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Well, we have done a really good job with uh, the questions. I hope everyone found this interesting and informative. If there aren't any more questions coming through, we might finish it up there. No problems. Anytime. We're here to help. Thank you so much for answering your questions. And yeah, thank you so much for everyone logging in and supporting us. Uh, if you are keen on another one of these, please let us know through our social media. Um, and also, I think I we had the... Um, survey that we collected so hopefully people will um will uh have said that they're interested in what they're interested in fingers crossed because i'd really love to do another one i don't know about you Tung, but i think it would be a lot of fun i've had a lot of fun doing this yeah for sure i think um you know just having more conversations around it is definitely gonna help a lot and uh push through the i guess the esports cause and um the the health of their players yeah um, cool Excellent. Uh, yeah, Kevin yeah. just said, yeah. I've started with seeing teenagers in private practice who happen to have problems due to video, mobile gaming, even as a general musculoskeletal physio, these encounters will come. So 100%. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I work primarily in aged care, not many esports gamers in that community. <laughs> <laughs> I'm closely tied to the pro Rocket League scene, though. I will definitely be reaching out to some of those lads yes 100 percent. if you have already got an in then that's the way that's the way to get into that sort of work all right beautiful okay thank you so much everyone have a fantastic evening hopefully we'll see you again soon uh it's been great all right see everyone have a good night